Iconoclast is a video game tribute to video games. It's not quite so reverential as a love letter and not quite self-referential enough to be metatextual. It sits comfortably in a space that acknowledges and respects its predecessors, for better and for worse. In an exactly opposite phrasing to Action Button's Tim Rogers' Action Button review of Doom, wherein the bottom line is Doom speaks for itself three hours and 53 seconds into the video, Iconoclast does not speak for itself. Iconoclast wields the musings of its older brothers and sisters like a chainsaw to slice through the baby's first steps tutorial that most games will serve you. It's not a difficult video game, but to love Iconoclasts, I genuinely believe you need also to love video games. In Iconoclasts, you play as Robin, this bouncy blonde lady with a penchant for being nice to people. And within one minute of taking control and stepping outside of Robin's home, you are given a tidy look at what the game will expect of you, and, more essentially, what you can expect from the game. There are a couple signs with basic controls printed on them here, a large statue in the form of a goddess, a couple smaller flashing objects, and some stark, chunky flora and ground textures outside Robin's home. The larger statue is a save point, the smaller one's destructible figures that, when broken, collect for you some unknown substance. A small node floats tauntingly here, it is something you cannot currently interact with, instantly instilling into your mind that this is somewhere to come back to when you've obtained that which does allow you to interact with said node. Pressing the pause button will open your menu, and you will be introduced to all the information one could need to parse precisely what this game is and is trying to be. There's an area name followed by a vague goal, then a map with a legend hovering mysteriously above it. Craft? Warp? You ask yourself, knowing instantly what this game is and what it borrows from as you, like me, are a capital G-A-M-E and R Gamer Boy. All the while, a chippy and uplifting major keyed tune bumps out from the speakers. A tune that will never leave your head. I promise. There's like this record scratch thing at the beginning that just... I'm not good with musical theory or anything, but like it really scratches behind my ears, you know? In a good way. <laughs> Within this singular minute, without any prior knowledge, it's clear that we're looking at a Metroidvania, the word coming from a clumsy melange of Metroid and Castlevania, two of the pioneering games of this specific genre. And for a long time, Iconoclast does not stray even a small amount from the formula it sets you up to expect. You do, very swiftly, find the tool that lets you interact with that node. You do, as is expected, find small things to craft at the locations marked with the green craft icon on your map. You do, following this trend, receive further tools of traversal, weaponry, and other key items to continue progressing further in the world, or unlock areas and items previously inaccessible. All of these concepts, all this criteria from music to level design to game feel, it's all set in place and heavily borrowed from other video games within the same genre and near identical gameplay concepts. But there's nothing wrong with this concept, as history has shown time after time. We even hold tight to popular idioms that communicate precisely this idea, such as imitation is the highest form of flattery, and copy from one it's plagiarism, copy from two and it's research. And Iconoclasts does not perform this research half-heartedly or with any malicious intent. It imitates proudly with flattery towards its inspirations, which it wears unashamedly on its sleeves, pants, shoes, chest, hat, hair, skin, and, and DNA. The way Iconoclasts behaves borders on indistinguishable from its contemporaries and predecessors. The character design screaming Owlboy, the map Metroid, the movement environmental station Alpha and Axiom Verge, the puzzles La Mulana, the boss fights Cave Story, and everything else combined. This genre, the Metroidvania, is perhaps the most video gamey genre you could possibly choose, too. Exploration, puzzle solving, supplementary side content, distinct visual style, skill testing, and reaction based battles. This is what I meant when I called Iconoclasts a video game tribute to video games. Take one look at the creator, Conjack's art Twitter, and you'll see an endless parade of love and care that has been and is currently being poured into new and old character and environment designs and animations. It's the work of a person who clearly knows where his talents and passions lie, and they're expressed their fullest within the world of Iconoclasts. Almost every cutscene in the game shows off a new animation or sprite set for these pixelated little dudes, and they all contain an extra frame or two than you would expect, bringing both life and buttery smoothness to the way Robin and co. present themselves. It's not just your standard boilerplate video game, it's a careful and calculated boilerplate video game. But that did leave me feeling, in a few ways, as someone who really wanted to peel back a couple layers of this experience, more than a little dissatisfied. 
If Iconoclast is so iconic in and of itself that every individual element evokes the nature of another source material, I couldn't help but ask myself why then I was not playing and reviewing the source material. The Metroids, Castlevanias, Environmental Station Alphas, Valdis Story, Abyssal Cities, Dust and Elysian Tales, Owl Boys, La Mulanas, Axiom Verges, Cave Stories, Shantays, and even, in some cases, the Kirby and the Amazing Mirrors. And these are just the games that I personally own. I most likely neglected more than one direct influencer to the game. But traveling down the rabbit hole of if A, then B, gets out of hand just as quickly as you can begin to think about its implications in this sense. If Iconoclasts pulls so heavily from Super Metroid, why don't I just play Super Metroid? It would, by contrast, clarify all that Iconoclasts is doing different and had changed and polished over the course of more than 25 years, while simultaneously espousing its own distinct original styles and ideas. The exact ideas I'm trying to pin down for long enough to be able to meaningfully talk about them. With just a moment to pause and reckon this with the fact that Super Metroid is a sequel to the original Metroid, the problem then comes clearer into focus. If Super Metroid pulls so heavily from Metroid, why don't I just play Metroid? So we go back to Metroid on the NES, before video games understood game theory and game feel and practical storytelling and hardware limitations prevented anything than the chunkiest visuals, the most limited palette, and the bare minimum and sound capability to produce a distinct melody. We can see then where Super Metroid refined and redefined what this kind of exploration could mean for video games, how a player could be reliably expected to solve problems and interact with a dynamic gameplay environment to progress. We also see an implementation of a very, very early New Game Plus mode encouraging the replaying, re-experiencing, and mastering the game as you become familiar and comfortable in its systems. But Metroid also is not a product of only itself. Exploration and puzzle solving are hallmarks of novels from time immemorial while the dark visuals, subdued tone, and subject matter are all directly influenced by the Alien series. My point by now should be close enough to your face that it's in danger of gouging your eye. There is nothing that is the product of itself, and nothing is truly original. To review Iconoclasts is to review 1979's Alien and Sigourney Weaver's astounding performance. To review Iconoclasts is to review the epic of Gilgamesh and the sense of adventure it imparts on its readers and its numerous writers. Game long into the abyss, and the abyss will game also into you. This does kind of hold true for practically everything, but the reason Iconoclasts, rather than every other thing invokes this specific kind of charade is because of the shamelessness and pride with which it practically vomits Super Metroid and Owlboy's adorable baby onto your screen. It would be easy enough to leave it at that, that to put it plainly, Iconoclasts is pretty good and fun if you like that sort of thing. But it presents me as a guy who makes videos on video games with an interesting problem. I don't like making reviews in the classic review format, so I cannot and will not take the thing piece by piece and tell you what is good and what is not. Not only because that's boring to me, but because Iconoclast is simultaneously worth an innumerable amount more than a review, it is also just as fully worth only a review. That is, in its form as a Metroidvania, the video gamiest style of video gamies. When I was first playing through this game with the purpose of writing something about it, I talked with my girlfriend about how I was enjoying it, but that it was kind of derivative. I told her that I knew what I would write about it already, unless, I joked, it really throws me for a loop in the last four hours. And the monkey's paw curled. Oh no! Andrew. Made a wish. Oh my land! I'm the type of person that, if told I have to play a game for 6 hours or roughly 55% of the total time for my average playthrough for it to get good, I will likely not play the game and will perhaps even lash out against the suggester for forcing upon me such an egregious notion. It's with that context in mind that I will say to you that the loop Iconoclast throws you for, 6 hours or roughly 55% of the total time for your average playthrough, is worth waiting for. That isn't to say that Iconoclasts was ever bad, just that it was, up until a point, barely more than the sum of its parts, parts which have been refined by countless games that have come before. But here exists a division, a clean break between Iconoclasts as a video game and Iconoclasts as any other form of visual art. And while the video game part is serviceable and fun in its own right, I can't help but think that with the quality of the less than video gamey aspects of the video game, it would have been almost as well off as a book or a graphic novel, if not for the few yet important threads binding the two unequal parts of Iconoclasts together.
At this point, I'm going to give you a spoiler warning for the genuinely, literally, and figuratively stellar storytelling that takes place here. And while I won't spoil every element of the plot, you might want to stop here if you want to play the game spoiler-free, yet with the knowledge that there is a goddamn diamond hidden within the geometric curls of Robin's bouncy hair. Though, I do recall at some point a couple years ago reading an article about a study that proved that people's appreciation for media was actually heightened after having it spoiled for them. Perhaps in them finding foreshadowing and symbolism that is easily missed on first runs through, I couldn't say to be sure. But maybe if you watch through this whole thing, you'll like Iconoclast more. I don't actually know. Let me begin by setting the stage for you as simply as the game itself does. You are Robin, a mechanic like your father before you. You've got yourself a heavy and powerful wrench that is a spring breeze for you to use, but the simple actions that you take with it, such as opening doors, swinging around, or near the beginning fixing up a clearly mass-produced home, shock and awe those around you, your proficiency astounding most bystanders. Before long, you learn that the actions you have been taking, i.e. opening doors and fixing houses, is against some set of rules that have been set in place by an extremist religious governing body. These actions, among others not exclusive to your mechanical ability, are seen as sinful, and those who sin are punished by the penance. A home in your neighboring town has been afflicted by this penance, leaving nothing but a frame and a smoldering crater, yet the people within said town live their lives with complete devotion to the patriarch known only as him in blue text, and to the matriarch known as mother. But clearly, they fear deeply what could happen to them should they slip up even slightly. You learn that the destruction of home number 8 was because Mrs. Andrus went out looking for a better spot to pick mushrooms, made some maps of the locations, and shared them with the town. No scripture forbade this behavior, yet she was punished all the same. Still, racked with grief, her husband does not fight the injustice. He cowers further into terror and shame, and vows to pray even more for his and his beloved souls. Soon, you are captured by this governing body, henceforth known as the One Concern, and are sent to a prison cell to await your own penance with a pirate girl named Mina. Of course, you escape and are set on the only obvious path, dismantle the oppressive institution however Robin sees fit. This is a fairly boilerplate plot, despite the drama that surrounds the core. Here, there exists oppression, and you play as someone who can fight it. The loop I've mentioned three times now is not, however, that Iconoclast ever deviates from this core. It's that the character's world and history maintain an incredible and genuinely surprising level of depth and, most importantly, internal consistency. A second playthrough of this game reveals that not once does anyone break character, even before the player is given enough information to paint a picture of this world. Characters act on motivations off-screen that went completely forgotten and unnoticed by me until revisited. Level design and character interaction never break the fourth wall, never even wink at the player, despite the intense referential video gaminess of the title as a whole. My first clip I recorded of my playthrough was half an hour long, and poring over it writing notes about the events that take place, the design of the structures, and the actions the player needs to perform to continue took me more than five times that amount of time, over two and a half hours. Unassuming props in the environment are relevant to the story at large, whether they take the form of plants, doors, houses, or even interior design. Every piece of the puzzle, from the background to the foreground, fits snugly in place with another set of pieces. Even more astonishing to me is that it's world-building done with no prior framework in place. None of it is based off of anything in the real world, or even loosely on another intellectual property. Even Robin, the player's character, exists independently and prior to the player's introduction to the world and behaves accordingly. Despite what seems at first to be a blank slate character archetype, Robin gradually boasts greater and greater independence not only from the player's direction, but from other characters within the world. And this happens so steadily and consistently over the course of the game that I barely even recognized it until the final words of the game were spelled out in front of me. Okay, Robin. I won't try to tell you what to do anymore. Her anger, her grief, her sense of justice, it's through the player's hands that Robin acts on her own, on the forces that drive her internally and externally, despite her, not long ago, having been little more than a well-animated vessel for the video game player to experience Konjak's world. But that all exists outside of the progression of Iconoclast's plot. While Robin and her motley crew are all distinct, believable, and consistent, their growth is far from the focal point of the story. The game continues further along the path of tyrannical oppression needing to be stopped while introducing new players to the script. A philosopher within the one concern, devout in his own way but in disagreement with the practices of both his superiors and inferiors. A particularly cruel and efficient member of the organization who both you and Robin will justifiably hate, but whose behavior is genuinely understandable and easy to sympathize with. 
The aforementioned mother shows up. With powers both wonderful and strange, it's clear to see why her people worship her as the mouthpiece for the him and their religion as a whole. A band of pirates, an explorer with a bounty on his head, a cabal of indoctrinated youth, and so many more factions and individuals, all with their own histories and impacts on how things will play out and why things did play out the way that we see now. It's difficult to write much on the story without going beat by beat or just forming a list of bullet points because there is so much here told through the biased words of individuals, environmental cues, and historical records that it took, and according to the Iconoclast's subreddit, still takes a collective of more than just one person to parse all the information. Within Iconoclast is a life-altering, world-ending, ideology-shattering plot with countless faced and faceless participants, a plot with such depth that the Iconoclast's wiki page of said plot holds an 18 by 10 table with the x-axis being information and the y-axis being characters. 180 boxes checked yes or no, implied or unknown, of who in this world knows what regarding this specific plot and how it is that they may or may not know this information. I don't know 180 things about anything, and while yes, this plot is in fact the most major piece of the plot of the game, it is far from all-encompassing, though its tendrils poke and prod into the other pieces, much like a piece to a jigsaw puzzle with 180 or more different tabs and, as the Wikipedia article for Jigsaw Puzzle states, blanks, that snugly pull the entire picture into a cohesive unit. If it were not intimidating to say so, I'd say, and this amount of information is us just getting started but I don't want to be intimidating, so I will not say that. But if you do decide to play through this game, you will understand that the above amount of information is, in fact, us just getting started. Because we haven't even gotten into the name of the game yet, Iconoclasts. People wiser than myself, or perhaps more curious and willing to Google things, will already know that iconoclasm is a belief system, that there is deep purpose in the destruction of icons, most frequently of religious or political basis. It is a belief centered upon tearing apart that which is venerated and simplified to the point of widespread acceptance without the thought into the origin of such icons' purpose. In the context of the game, Iconoclasts, the Iconoclasts being referenced are, of course, Robin and her buds, tearing apart the ruling government and their religion. A piece of this that I nearly missed, though, is that Robin, the notoriously caring and helpful protagonist, does this mechanical dismantling with a figurative smile on her face, and not because she knows it will lead to better lives for those currently wronged by the system, but because what she feels is a deep, seething anger at what has happened to her, her friends, and her family. Going back to the very first screen of the game, Robin literally reaps some form of spoils from the immediate destruction of the images of Mother. Retribution was brought down on a woman in the first town for creating a map to pick mushrooms, yet, with the press of the start button, you see that Robin, not you, has begun keeping a detailed map of everywhere she goes. Robin, with an ear-to-ear -ear grin, is constantly working to dismantle this iconography that she actively hates. This is like an actual spoiler warning now. This I didn't cover very many specifics before, but... Uh, if if you really care about like the climax of the game, this is this is where I'm gonna this is where I'm gonna spoil the whole thing. So until as a final culmination of everything that she had pushed towards, the player and Robin together meet the very God, the Him that has been referenced and revered the entire game prior. And after all the intrigue, the mystery, the buildup, he is nothing more than a monster originating from somewhere in the cosmos, with no intentional ties to or influence on the denizens of the planet that worship him. He is not good or evil, he holds no love nor disdain for the planet's people, mere ants to his power and potential. He just is. The one single reference to the real world that Iconoclasts makes is with a quote taken with a distinct sense of black humor, from Charles Manson. Look down at me and you see a fool, look up at me and you see a god, look straight at me and you see yourself. This cosmic joke is taken to an even further level when, as is destined, Robin faces off against the Star Worm, him, as the game's final boss fight. Robin wins, and the cherry on top is that the Star Worm was never even sentient. It is a spaceship for a silly-looking bird person who was simply treating the planet as what was probably supposed to be a fuel source for some unknown stellar journey. Once the Star Worm's visage is shattered, you see that within its eyes is nothing more than a cockpit complete with fuzzy dice hanging over a mirror. Theoretical physicist Michio Kaku puts it succinctly in a manner you've likely heard referenced before. Let's say we have an anthill in the middle of the forest, and right next to the anthill they're building a 10-lane superhighway. And the question is, 
Would the ants be able to understand what a 10-lane superhighway is? Would they be able to understand the technology and the intentions of the beings building the highway next to them? These are rhetorical questions in reference to the concept of higher-level intellectual life, a quick and dirty answer to the notorious Fermi paradox. Iconoclast sets up a delicate house of cards with each character, ideology, action, and piece of history stacking on top of one another to make a grand structure, only to have the table that the cards sat on, the Birdman Starworm pilot, wake up from its nap, stand up, and walk away, without turning back to look at the centuries of work it had knocked over, without even noticing. In practice, the message of iconoclasts is not one of disestablishmentarianism, but more so one condemning the control of information in any form, be that through the media, government, or most relevant here, religion. It is the stance that knowledge is power, but also that power is easily corruptible, if not corruption itself. It's a story about how motivation and the ability to stir into action is something that comes from within, but that it is through support and community that action taken can lead to the fruition of an ideal. And it's a story about a young woman who's so pissed off that she kills God. To play the video game is to play Metroid and Castlevania and Owlboy and Axiom Verge and whatever else pops into your mind when you think of video gamey video games. But to complete Iconoclasts and experience it as something more than its mechanical video gamey parts is something else entirely. To complete Iconoclasts is to witness a new world through the eyes of someone who was there long before you ever were. It's performed with a style that is iconic and unique to the very best of the science fiction genre, and while the information seems sparse and is limited to around an 11 hour long casual playthrough, Iconoclasts, to me, pulls off a miracle in standing alongside the works of Philip K. Dick, Dan Simmons, and Frank Herbert. Or maybe I'm just a sucker for good pixel art and sci-fi. Who could say? Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching. Um, I really hate to ask to do this at the end of this thing, but if you could like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, I only ever put out stuff that I think is actually good and I put a lot of work into, and it's at most every couple of months, so I won't clog up your feed or send endless notifications to your phone or anything like that. Yeah, thanks again for listening to me talk about the things that I like, and uh, take it easy.